let me begin by recording what we saw last time. So if you have a quantum field theory, then we discuss the condition under, under which it is renormalizable. Okay, in fact, we discuss the condition under which it is what is called power counting renormalizable. So a quantum field theory is power counting renormalizable. the following two conditions hold. The first condition is that all coupling constants, all coupling constants have mass dimension. This means that if the action has a term of the following form, d d x times some O, okay, where there is some combination of fields, then dimension G should be positive or zero. And you can easily verify that this implies that dimension O could be less than or equal to G. Okay, because the dimension of G together with the dimension of this, which is uh, minus D, plus the dimension of this should always add up to zero. Right? Because the total action, of course, is always dimensionless. So if you demand the dimension of D, G is larger than or equal to zero, that means dimension of O should be less than or equal to is this clear? Okay, so for example, in the scalar field theory in four dimension, it allows you to go up to five to the four interactions, whereas in four dimension E is four, okay, and five to the four has dimension four, right? because five has dimension one, but you cannot go to five to the five or five to the six interaction, because that will violate this one. The second condition that we saw is that all coupling constants, all coupling of dimension greater than equal to zero must be present. So this condition guarantees that you don't have uncontrolled divergences because if you have coupling constants of negative dimension, then by repeating it again and again, you can get more and more divergences. Whereas this condition guarantees that you have enough number of counter terms to remove the divergences which would be present, okay, given the first condition is satisfied. Now we'll see that we can relax this constraint using symmetries, but I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But first, I have to add some qualification. So the first point, which I have actually already mentioned earlier, is that for this to hold, we need that bosonic propagator. Both as 1 over k square for large k and for the propagator goes as 1 over k for large k. And this is a generically true. This is what the dimension uh, counting implies, and this is generically true. But there are exceptions, and we have seen this. Exception is 
the Massey Bayes that we, for example, so if you remember the propagator for the Massey Bayes that was 1 over k square plus m square times eta mu nu plus k nu k nu over m square. And this goes to constant as k goes to infinity. Okay, it doesn't fall off. Okay, it goes to a constant because that is 1 over k square and k nu k nu. And this spoils renormalizability because now we have this 1 over m squares coming in from the propagator. Right? This is something that we didn't count. So we counted the total degree of divergence. Right? We assume that there is no all the propagators was one over k square. Okay, or one over k. Okay, if it's formula. We didn't account for the fact that there may be one over m square in the propagator. But if there one of there is one over m square, clearly this propagator will cause more divergence than you have what you have counted. Right? Because instead of falling off as one over k square, it falls off as k to the zero. So in these cases, we cannot, even if these conditions are satisfied, you cannot conclude this theory is normalized. Okay, in fact, this was the one of the bottlenecks for proving the normalization because of the weak interaction, okay, where we knew that we have massive vector fields, but we couldn't have any normalizable theory. As we discussed in the gauge theory, what happens is that in one particular gauge, the propagator does indeed have this theory here. In that gauge, it's hard to prove renormalizability. But there's another gauge where you just add this del mu and mu whole square kind of uh, gauge fixing term. In that gauge, this term is not there. Okay, instead, the propagator has a more uh, a, a somewhat different form, which goes as one over k square as, at large. Okay. So in that gauge, you can prove renormalizability. At least you can prove that it's power bounding renormalizable. Because the propagator has a right here. Is this clear? So this is something I have to keep in mind. Okay. That if we get a theory which is power counting renormalizable, then we satisfy these two conditions. Okay. We still have to check that all the propagators behave correctly. Yes. yes, you have to show for that the theory is gauge invariant. So the physical amplitudes shouldn't depend on which gauge you have chosen. So what would happen is that if we choose this gauge, then a generic off-shell amplitude will be divergent. You cannot renormalize it. But those divergences will cancel from the on-shell S matrix elements. So those are the physical quantities. Or when you calculate the correlation function of gauge invariant operators, then those will be not affected by this divergence. Because the correlation functions of gauge invariant operators are independent of what gauge you choose. But a generic off shell Green's functions, like NU, NU Green's function, that will not be normalized. Is that point Exactly. So some of these terms which should have caused divergences okay. will eventually go away for gauge invariant operators. <coughs> the second point, okay, is more subtle. And that has to do with what is called overlapping divergences.
So to see what the issue is, you recall that when we counted the degree of divergence of a given graph, okay, how divergent it is, okay, just from dimensional analysis. So we assume that all the loop moments are becoming large. Okay, so that all the propagators okay, can be thought of as 1 over L squared as 1 over L slash, so drop all the masses, and that's where that, that's the limit in which you counted how many parts of momentum are in the numerator, how many are in the numerator. Okay. But in principle, you could get divergences from sub diagrams, okay, where not all momentum become large, but when some of the momentum become large. Okay. For example, if we have a QED, okay, let's say QED. Okay, I think I'm using QED because it's probably purely neat. You are familiar with the Feynman rules. We can consider a diagram like this. Two loop diagram. Okay. These are the external electrons and positrons, and these are the photon types. Now you would easily recognize that this diagram is divergent because it's one over k square, one over k, one over k. That goes 1 over k to the 4 altogether. Okay, so this is divergent, d4 k over k to the 4. This is also divergent okay, because it's 1 over k square, 1 over k. Right? So that's 1 over k cube. So d4 k over k cube is again divergent for large scale. But there are also sub divergences okay, where this loop momentum may be finite, this is large. Okay, or this is large, this is finite. Or sorry, this is large, this is finite. Not all loop momentum becoming large simultaneously. <coughs> but as far as these diagrams are concerned, this is not a big problem because you can easily convince yourself that once you have made sure that the three point part X is finite by adding a counter term and this is finite by adding a counter term, the whole thing can be made finite. Okay? So for example, if you add to these the following diagrams. order, you have to add all the counter term diagrams. This is clear, this is two loop, right? Order alpha squared, square of the fine structure function. This, there is a already a loop here, okay? So this goes as alpha, and there is a counter term, okay, which is one order alpha, so this is also order alpha squared. This is also order alpha squared because this is has two parts of E. And there is a counter term here. Okay, so this is alpha to the four. And this is also alpha to the four because there's a fa factor of alpha from here and a factor of alpha from here. So all of these diagrams are of order alpha to the four. Sorry, alpha squared. E to the four. Right? This is clear that alpha is E squared, right? E is the coupling of the photon to the electron, right? So we have one, two, three, four, okay. Forget about this, this is common. Okay? If you count this, then all of the diagrams is of order e to the six. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. This is e to the six. Here, this is e squared. This is e, but this is e cube, right? Because it's a counter term. Okay, that starts at one higher order, so e cube. So e, 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 E cube, that E to the 6, same counting goes here and the same counting goes here. So the sum of these two, you can easily see that this can be written as, you can now see what cancels that, right? The divergences in this is cancelled, this plus this is finite, right? Similarly, this plus this is finite. So when you look at this fourth term, right, it's as if you have the following thing, that this is equal to, let me write this way. Well, 
where this vortex is this this and this is this one these four diagrams together can be thought of as one single diagram like this okay but this is the sum of two terms the original loop diagram plus a counter term and this is the sum of two terms the original loop diagram plus a counter term and now you can see that this diagram is made finite because this is finite okay by definition the sum of these two gives finite result and similarly these two sum of these two give finite result So even though there are some divergences, okay, where this can become large keeping this finite, or this can become large while keeping by keeping this finite, once you add all the counter terms, it's clear that this diagram gives finite result. Yes. Both of them can become large, yes. right? but once you have written it in this form, yes. right, then it's manifestly clear that whether one becomes large or both becomes large, this is always finite, right? Because this is divergence free, right? Because this by definition is the sum of these two, right? Okay. So this can become large. When this is small, of course, this part is finite, right? But when this is large, the divergence is cancelled by this. Similarly, when this is small, this is of course finite, and when this is large, the divergence is cancelled by this, right? So in this form, right, which is identical to the sum of these four diagrams, there is no divergence at all. Is this point here? So while this diagram has sub divergences, where one momentum becomes large keeping the others other finite, these sub divergences are not no, bothersome. Okay, that because they can be easily shown to be finite by rewriting the amplitude sum of the four terms in this way. But what I'll do now is to give examples of diagrams where this is not so simple. And this is where this problem of overlapping divergence is coming. Sorry, if there is no sub, uh, sub divergence, yes. this only the third, uh, isn't it that uh, the third diagram will, the third, cross, uh, the third counter term will cancel the the third means both cross. Both cross. Last one. The last one. This one. Yes. So see, this will not cancel the whole thing, right? Because this is divergent by itself. Because this has a 1 over epsilon, this has a 1 over epsilon, right? Both of these are divergent because counter terms are divergent because these have been adjusted so that it cancels the divergence of this one, right? So this by itself will not cancel this. So you are asking whether this cancels this? Yeah. Actually, this comes to the same sign as this. So it will add. You have to include the combinatorics, we'll find that this actually adds. Because this is negative of this. Right? Because this plus this is finite. Right? So if this is divergent, this has to be adjusted to be negative of that. Right? Similarly, this is negative of this. Right? So this will not cancel this. This will just double the divergence. Right? These are the ones okay, which will give negative because here, one is positive, the counter term gives negative. Okay. And here, this is positive, the counter term gives negative. Okay. And that's the way the count cancellation goes. Is this point here? Okay. So this is not going to cancel this. Okay. What is going to cancel is the sum of all four that cancel. Well, the point is, once the counter term vortex is there, you have no choice. I mean, you just determine the action, right? You have to use the, the vortex that it gives. Right? If you don't include the last one, then the, of course the whole thing is not finite. Is this point here? Okay. So now I'm going to draw another diagram again in QED, okay? But where this is things are not so simple.
So let me label the momentum. Suppose this is P, this would be minus P. Let's call this L1. This would be minus P minus L1. This let's call it L2. This should be P minus L2. This is Now you see that in this diagram, <coughs> we can have divergences when L1 becomes large. Why? Because these are Carmelian propagators. Maybe I should draw some arrows. These are Carmelian propagators. So one over L1 stands. One suppose L1 is becoming large, keeping L2 fixed. In that case, this is one over L1 stands. One over L1 stands. This is one over L1 plus L2 square. So in the large L1 limit, at fixed L2, this is 1 over L1 square, 1 over L1, 1 over L1, right? Four factors of L1 in the denominator. D4 L1 over L1 to D4 is divergent. Similarly, this one is divergent because when L2 becomes large, right? If L2 becomes large, then again, this is 1 over L2, 1 over L2, 1 over L1 plus L2 whole square. In the large L2 limit, that's also 1 over L2 square. So, D4 L2 over L2 to D4, that's becoming large. So, this part of the diagram is divergent, this part of the diagram is divergent. And this is what one calls overlapping divergence. Maybe that the part of the loop which can have side sub divergence overlap. We can draw a square around this one which is divergent or draw a square around this vertex, which is divergent. But these squares are not separate. Is that clear? Maybe I should draw. Or let me draw a this line like that. So this is one sub-diagram, which is divergent, right? And this is the other sub-diagram, which can be divergent. And now it's not quite clear from this structure that if we add the corresponding counter term diagrams, let me draw that counter term diagrams also. This plus see total number of parts of E is one from here, one from here, one from here, one from here. So altogether E to the four, right? Or alpha square. So here we need this counter term should be E cube, right? The leading term is E, counter term is E cube, this is E. Similarly here, this is E, there is counter term here, this is E cube. And finally, because this whole thing itself is two part function, that can be a counter terms like this, which should be on a to the four. So the question is, can we make this finite? Make this diagram finite after we add the sum of these. Is this point clear? These are all the relevant diagrams in this case. Is it okay or not? Okay. Yes. There should be another diagram that. One uh, Fermi, uh, one uh, <coughs> one gauge field uh, propagator, then Fermi line, then there will be e square. Uh, the loop, the self self energy of the formula line. Yeah, this one. <coughs> this one. Is that what you are asking? Okay. 
See, this one is not too problematic because this can be cancelled by adding a counter term also. When you add to this a counter term, okay? Then this cancels by themselves and the overall momentum may become large. Okay. That's why I have not in, written this diagram. Okay. These are not the only di divergent diagrams. Right? There are this and then the corresponding counter term inserted on this. Okay. But those, let's not worry about right now. These are the ones which are going to correct this part. Right? So directly what to what do things. That if this momentum becomes large, right? Keeping this fixed, maybe that's cancelled by this. Okay. If this momentum becomes large, okay, keeping this momentum fixed, maybe that's cancelled by this. Okay. And when both of them become large, then that should be cancelled by this. Okay, that's the general uh, uh, intuition. But the question is, is that intuition correct or not? Okay. And the problem comes because if you recall that when we have a self energy diagram like this. You may recall the phi square correction. There are two kinds of counter terms you could add. One is a mass counter term, right? That multiplies the phi square term. And then for the two point function, there's a wave function involving counter term, which happened to be equal to one, which was not necessary for the phi 4 theory, okay. but that was a term which gave term proportional to p square, right? Because wave function, so we had, let me write this, you had a z tilde phi minus one times del mu phi del mu phi. So this is one of the counter terms, del mu phi r, del mu phi r. And then there is another term, which is z tilde phi z m, minus one times phi r squared. Okay, these are the two kinds of counter terms we had started with. Then we said that this fixes z tilde phi z m minus one. Okay, this was fixed because by having to cancel this. Okay, in the uh, phi four This was a possible counter term, but this would have multiplied a term that is proportional to p square. This didn't have a divergence proportional to p square. Okay, that was an accident. Okay, and higher order there will be divergence proportional to p square, and you have to adjust this to cancel it. Okay, for example, if you take a diagram like this, okay, this certainly has divergence which are p dependent. So what is the philosophy that? Philosophy is that we have a divergent diagram which relatively expands in momentum, right? And we argued that that um, expansion diverges up to a certain order in Taylor series expansion, beyond which it becomes finite. And up to that order in Taylor series expansion, we have enough counter term to cancel it out. Is that point clear? Okay, that's the way we said that we have to adjust the counter terms. Now, if we look at this. Term over here. We had started with a forget about the uh, gauge invariance and so on. There is an AMU box AMU kind of term. You could add a counter term for that. That would give a term proportional to case P square. Let's forget about the fact that the gauge fields cannot get mass. Okay, take so AMU AMU term. Okay, so just counting the uh, all possible operators of certain uh, uh, allowed dimension. MU MU clearly has dimension less than or equal to two, uh, four, okay, so you can add that. The corresponding counter term will be constant. Then it will not have any p dependence. But those are the two possible counter terms: MU MU counter term or MU box M. Okay. So this means that you can cancel up to quadratic order in momentum. Right? You cannot add a counter term for MU box square mu. That has too many momentum derivatives, right? mu box square mu, what is the dimension of this term? It's dimension six, because mu has dimension one, right? Box square will have dimension four, mu has dimension one, so mu box square mu has dimension six, right? That's 
above four. So you cannot add a counter term for any box square anyway. So this means that in order that this can cancel the leftover divergence, which are not already cancelled by these, we have to make sure that in the Taylor series expansion, the divergence stops after t square. You cannot get anything more than quadratic divergence. Is that point clear? That if you have gotten more than uh, divergence in the coefficient of p to the 4, then you are in trouble. So how do we determine whether there are divergences in p to the 4, coefficient of p to the 4? We start differentiating the amplitude with respect to p. Right? And if we find that after differentiating more than twice, you have got a finite result, then everything is fine. Is that clear? So the question is, is the derivative of the amplitude beyond two derivatives of p. Is that finite or is that infinite? So you like look at this diagram. Well, this diagram is messed up, so let me write, me write it again. So this is p going this way, minus p going this way. L1, L2, p2 minus p minus. Well, there will be finite p, which is proportional to p to the four. The divergent p should be uh, gone after like, taking more than two derivatives, right? Finite pieces, of course, we can uh, certainly allow. Is this okay? So after taking two derivatives, <coughs> more than two derivatives, it should be a finite result. That's what you have to check. Okay, because you have to tell series expand this diagram in powers of p and make sure that only up to two powers of p can be divergent after that it's all finite. So take this diagram, okay, now I'll redraw it again, okay, and start differentiating with respect to p. Okay. And you can take the derivative inside the integral. Okay. Take the integral and start differentiating with respect to p. So you see that there are two places where p dependence comes, in the way I have labeled it, right? p dependence comes in two places. So you can differentiate this or you can differentiate this. Okay, the first term you differentiate with respect to p, you will get two terms, one where the derivative acts on this, the other one where the derivative acts on this. Okay. So let's suppose that you have taken the derivative and acted on this. Okay. We now do it a second time. We again have a choice of either take, making the derivative act on this or on this. Okay. Let's do it here. Okay. Now do it a third time. We can again do it here. We can fourth time we can do it here. It's our choice. Right? There are some of many terms. Right? These crosses will be distributed all over. Okay? But we can choose one term where all the derivatives are acted on this one. Now every time you act a, with a derivative with respect to p, right? you bring down a one over uh, loop over there, right? Because if you take p squared plus l, say p minus l whole square, right? This is Sorry, p plus l1 whole square plus m square. So 1 over p plus l1 whole square plus m square. Del del p mu is p plus l1 mu is a factor of 2, and then we have a factor of 2 minus p plus l1 whole square plus m square whole square. Okay? So here, this was 1 over L square for large L. This we see already is 1 over L cube. Right? So this is following our intuition that the more derivative we apply, the more diverge, convergent you should get. Right? Because we apply derivative, we get 1 over from 1 over L square to 1 over L cube. You apply it once more on this, you will get 1 over L to the 4. Is that clear? If you apply del del p mu again, okay. you either remove this p plus l1, either this becomes any uh, delta, okay. you have to differentiate p, then you get 1 over l to the 4, or you differentiate this one again, so 
factor. So you get two factors of p plus L1 and three factors of this below. So every time we differentiate respect to p mu, you are getting a one over L1 factor, which is good because it's making the integral more convergent. But you see, if we fit terms like this, however many times you apply p, there is always a term where all the derivatives act on this leg. And you have done nothing to make this part convergent. Right? This part is as divergent as ever, right? Because 1 over L square, 1 over, well, 1 over L, 1 over L, 1 over L square. And there is a different integral there. There is a different integral there. So before L1 integral has been made finite. Okay? If you take that simultaneously, before L1, before L2, all of them becoming large. That has also become uh, been made finite, right? Because then 1 over L1 part will also give you a part of 1 over L, right? But 1 over L2, this divergence has not gone by taking arbitrary number of variables as to the P. Okay. So that better go by itself, otherwise you are in trouble. Is, is considering one term? There, are other terms. there are other terms. So you either have to make an effort to show that they cancel, or this divergence, so this divergence will not go away by itself, it has to cancel again something. Okay. And so this showing that it always cancels is the problem of showing that the overlapping divergences don't uh, matter. This can be shown, but the full proof is quite complicated. Okay, so I'll not do that. But this is something that you have to keep in mind. That the proof of renormalization doesn't just involve doing power counting. Okay, because otherwise, I mean, you could have proved renormalization in just one, uh, two lines, right? Dimensional analysis, that, that's what I did, <laughs> right? But there is more to proving renormalization than dimensional analysis. Okay, and much of it has to do with the overlapping diver. Okay, there are various tricks to handle this. In this case, basically what will happen is that yes, indeed it is true that as you are making more and more derivatives, this is still remaining divergent. But that will cancel against this graph. Okay, as you take more and more derivatives with respect to p, this will also give terms. Okay, this is of course finite, this part is finite, but there's a infinite factor sitting here. Okay, and that factor will cancel the divergences that you are getting. Okay, and similarly, when the derivatives all act on this, this factor will cancel. Counter term. Counter term has one power of e square compared to the original uh, vortex, right? So this counter term has e q, right? A self energy counter. So this will have e to the four because this is two loop counter term. Is this point clear? Okay. So the net upshot is that the overlapping divergences have to be dealt with, okay, but one can show that overlapping divergences do not spoil renormalizability. Okay, eventually you can show that the divergences do cancel once you have the power quantity renormalization. Okay, so this is something that I'll not prove. Okay, you can, I mean, there are old fashioned proofs, there are new versions of proofs. Okay, but it can be shown that the divergences cancel, these overlapping divergences. And this is true just for QD or for? No, for general case. Okay, that once you have two power continuity normalizability, mm -hmm. right, and all these other problems that I mentioned are not there. Okay, this uh, propagator is having one over m square kind of thing. Okay, you consider this is true in general. This two loop, yeah, the two loop counter term will be something like AU box AU. M square AU AU. In fact, in this case, there is also one more structure, right? If you forget about gauge invariance and everything, right? Then there is also term like del mu AU. Del mu AU, for example, right? So you have to, see, if you want to show it to be part from you have to add all possible terms in the action, right? I'm not worried about gauge invariance right now, right? So you have to add all possible terms of dimension less than or equal to four, right? All of these terms of dimension less than or equal to four. Okay, so you have to add all of these, and the, so when you normalize, each of them will have a, 
adjustable Z coefficient in front. Mm. So this will also also have some term, right? Some alpha times. So there will be Z alpha, Z m, and the mu wave function normalization. Okay. Those three constants have to be adjusted to cancel the hypergenesis of this. Okay. But the issue is to show that just by adjusting those three constants, you can get away. Okay. We cannot add more parts. Right? You cannot have a, if you had a four derivative acting on this. That's not an allowed counter term, right? Because that's dimension larger than four. So if the hard derivatives of this, some of these three, uh, four uh, graphs, the four derivatives were to P1, if that had been divergent, then there's no way to cancel it. Okay, so that divergence better get cancelled by when you add up these. Is this point clear? Any questions? I'll move to the next topic. So the next topic has to do with roll of cement. So what I have told you so far is that if there is a coupling which has dimension less than or dimension less than or equal to zero, you must add it. Right? Because you need the corresponding counter term to cancel out the diamond. Okay. But this can be relaxed if you have a symmetry. Okay. So the correct statement is that if you have a symmetry, then you must add all possible couplings that are invariant under that symmetry. Okay. And the idea is that if you have a symmetry, okay. then it is true that by restricting to couplings which are invariant under the symmetry, you have less number of counter terms to adjust. Right? Because the number of allowed terms that you have introduced is less, so the number of, number of real constants will also be less. Will also be less. Okay. But at the same time, it is also true that the number of divergent diagrams will also be less. Because the diagrams which are not invariant under the symmetry will never be generated. Okay. So as long as they have included all the terms that are consistent with a the, with the given symmetry, okay. you have enough number of adjustable parameters which can be used to cancel out the divergences. So as an example, okay, we can start with phi to the fourth here. Okay, this is something we have already seen in some form or other. Or the other. So example, phi to the fourth theory. Here the action was integral d four x and as it stands, it certainly doesn't include all possible couplings which can have dimension less than or equal to zero. Okay, or in terms of operators, we have not added all operators of dimension less than or equal to four. Okay, which is equivalent to adding couplings of dimension greater than or equal to zero. So for example, we have not added integral d4 x5. Let's call this g1. Or g3 integral d4 x5 q. Okay, by the standard dimension counting, this should have been included in that. Okay, because G1 
has dimension three. Right? Dimension of G one is three. So when it says minus four plus one, right? That minus three. So you have dimension three. This has dimension two, one. One, so these could have been added. Now let's recall why they should have been added. Why do we need this coupling? The reason that we needed this okay, in our general argument is the following that we define g1 as z g1 times g1 r i as z phi t will have to be half phi r and g3 as z g p. Okay, the renormalized couplings. And then we'll write g1 integral d4x phi as g1 r integral d4x phi r. We treat this as an original action and then plus z g1 z phi tilde to the half minus 1. Similarly, we will write g3 integral d4x phi cube as g3r integral d4x phi r cube plus z g3 z phi cube minus 1 integral d4x. And then what we will do is we will treat this as counter terms and use these z's to cancel divergences. That was the general philosophy, right? That we need these couplings because we have we have the z which you can adjust to have cancel divergences. So what divergence will this term cancel? Which graph? One point function, right? So you is a one point function. This is cancelled by z g1. Cancelled by z g1. What about this one? This counter term. This will cancel the divergence of the three part function, right? Because it's phi r cube. So this, this will be cancelled by z g2. But you can easily check that in phi 4 theory, if you take these, this action, they will never have diver diagrams like this. Because in every vortex, always four phi's meet. Right? So whatever you join them, yeah, you can never get a diagram where one phi leg sticks out and nothing else. Okay? Which is a consequence of the phi goes to minus phi symmetry. Okay, but you can also see diagram. Diagrammatically, it's impossible to draw a diagram in phi 4, phi four theory okay. where you only have a, a single line or where you have three lines coming out. Okay. On the other hand, once you have this, if you add these vertices, then of course you can get diagrams like this. Okay. So once you allow even one coupling which violates this symmetry, then you have to add everything. Okay, because then you start generating these kinds of diagrams. 
So you don't have a choice of adding some of the terms and not others. Okay, you either add everything that breaks the symmetry, or you add nothing that breaks the symmetry. Okay, that symmetry must be preserved. So this is a way we can bypass this restriction that you must add everything. That if you can find a symmetry, then the rule is that you must add everything consistent with the symmetries of the action. Is this point clear? Now, since the symmetries will play an important role, okay, even in understanding the quantization of gauge fluids, what I'll do now is to describe a somewhat more non-trivial example and see how things work here. Okay, it will again be the same principle that we have to add everything consistent with symmetries. So for if you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay, then what you can show is that you can you continue to use the symmetry of the original action. Okay? So the fact that you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, then of course the phi goes to minus phi symmetry is broken by the choice of action. Okay? But that doesn't affect your amortization. Okay? As long as the full action contains only uh, phi goes only, only those terms which are invariant when phi goes to minus phi, okay? you are safe. Right? You don't have to include uh, in, include explicit phi cube terms. So, so the expansion of the echo does not respect the symmetry. Yes. So, this can That's right. Yeah. But the point is, you don't have to add extra uh, extra counter terms. Right? What you can show is that you take the original action, right? Take this action, okay? change the sign of m square to plus. This action has less number of counter terms. Okay, then the full action, then, then now uh, a general action. Okay? He, this action has a counter term for a denomination of phi, okay? so that's z phi or z tilde phi. Okay? We have a zm and we have a z lambda. Okay? Now, once the symmetry is spontaneously broken, okay, you will start generating all these atoms. This one, this one, and so on. Right? So you may wonder that further you need more counter terms to cancel this. What you can show is that just by adjusting these zm, z lambda, and z tilde phi, you can actually cancel all the divergences. The non-trivial relations between the various kinds of divergences that we'll get, so that by adjusting a fewer constants, you can you can cancel more divergences. So spontaneous symmetry breaking doesn't require doesn't spoil your normalization. Is this point clear? Okay, this is something I have not proven, but this can be shown. That even if this matrix is spontaneously broken, you can continue to use the limited set of couplings that are a consequence of the original symmetry. Similarly, the The original theory one? No, it was a signature that the symmetry was spontaneously broken. Right? But the fact that the original theory was renormalizable for uh, in the unbroken phase, that is good enough to argue to show that just by adjusting those few constants, you can cancel all the divergences. So the point is that now there are more divergences than there are constants. If you work in the broken symmetry factor, right, then there are clearly more divergences than there are constants. Nevertheless, what you can show is that adjusting those few constants. Right? So, what will you do? You will adjust those few constants to cancel a few divergences. Right? Say divergences in 4 phi coupling and then 2 phi coupling. Okay? Then you have to worry what about this? Is this still divergent or not? Right? You don't have any more adjustable parameter, right? Because you have already used up the Zm, uh, Z phi, and Z lambda okay? to cancel those two, two point functions and four point function divergence. But what I'm saying is that you can show that just with those adjustments, you can show that the divergences that can possibly arise here 
and here are also automatically done. Is this point clear? So you'll see an example of this not in the case of continuous symmetry breaking, but in the uh, uh, case of continuous symmetry that I'm going to discuss. Okay, where apparently unrelated divergences okay, actually get cancelled by fewer number of adjustable parameters. So we'll consider the case of a complex scalar field. Complex scalar with u one side. So the general action for this is integral. These are all the terms that you can write consistent to it. The symmetry for those two is the I alpha times phi. Is this okay? But if you are just counting in terms of dimension, there are many more terms that you have left out. For example, in integral phi star phi phi plus complex complex. This certainly has dimension less than four, right? Dimension three of it. The corresponding coupling constant we have dimension one. Okay, so this would have been allowed just by power counting numbers. Or Integral phi star phi 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 plus complex complication. All of these terms would have been allowed. But they would not satisfy this symmetry. Okay, and the general principle says that it is possible to do without them. Now, if you work in terms of complex fields, it's clear that you cannot generate them. Is that clear in terms of Feynman diagrams? Why you can't generate them? Why can't you generate a term like this? Five star contracts with five. Five star contracts with five. Yes. Yeah. So one way to see this in terms of diagrams is that the lines carry arrows. Right? And the vortices have equal number of arrows going in and coming out. Right? Like phi star phi holds there. Okay. Two arrows going in, two arrows coming out. Okay. So in any given diagram, the number of arrows should be constant. The number of arrows that are going in must come out. Right? Because the number of arrows is constant, is constant in every body. Okay. And these graphs will correspond, these will correspond to graphs where the number of arrows going in is not the same as the number of arrows coming out. Right? So that's what I want to see that this diagram should never be a okay. But we will now make life a little more complicated by working with real value fields. Okay, and see how it works there. The advantage of what, well, advantage or disadvantage in the way, in whatever you look at, that the, what, when you work in terms of real fields, this symmetry is not absolutely manifest. This symmetry. Okay, it is of course there, 
given it's not absolutely manifest, and we will see that that has some interesting consequences. So let's take i is equal to 1 over root 2, i1 plus i i2, and write the action in terms of real bits. So the action will be given by integral d4x. So the symmetry is phi 1, phi 2 <coughs> goes to cos alpha, sin alpha, minus sin alpha, cos alpha. This, uh, this action in fact had another symmetry which I didn't write down. I goes to phi star. Okay, which is uh, independent of this. So if we extend phi and phi star, you can check that the gas independence are the same. Okay, now this is of course a symmetry of the action, this is the original symmetry, except that. In the phi 1, phi 2 variables, when you write down the Feynman rules, the consequence of this symmetry is not absolutely manifest. Okay, and we will see that, that leads to some interesting relations. But let's see which symmetry will be manifest. Okay, some symmetries are still manifest in this way of writing the action. One is phi 1, phi 2 exchange. This action is obviously symmetric on phi 1, phi 2 exchange. Right? And that will be manifest in the Feynman diagrams. That for every phi 1, if you replace every phi 1 by phi 2 and phi 2 by phi 1, you get an error Feynman diagram, right? So phi 1, phi 2 exchange is manifest. Phi 1 goes to minus phi 1. That's manifest, right? Because all terms are invariant under. phi 1 goes to minus phi 1 and similarly phi 2 goes to minus phi 1. Pardon? Yeah, so these are special cases of this. I am writing the special cases. Well, the special case is actually phi 1 goes to minus phi 2, phi 2 goes to phi 1, but let's uh, not worry about this. This together with the phi goes to phi star, okay, will have those as well. But this symmetry is not manifest at the level of the final rules. Okay, and we'll see what this means. Okay, these are of course they are as part of the action, so this must have some consequence for the no, five rules. But is that that it's not manifest? So this, if given this, let's try to renormalize. How do you renormalize? We will write phi 1 as the tilde phi to the half times phi 1 r. Now, because of the phi 1 phi 2 exchange symmetry, we will take phi 2 to be renormalized by the same renormalizing process. Right? It's clear that they should have the same exact data. 
right? Because phi one and phi two exchange symmetry is there. So whatever it constant you use to normalize phi one must be the same constant that you normalize phi two. And then lambda equal to z lambda times lambda. So with this, let's work out the counter terms. So for this, the counter term will be minus half I'm just I'm writing the count term directly with a Writing the action first and then dividing into original terms and counter terms. Okay, by now it should be familiar, right? How to write the counter terms. So if we write, we substitute this in the original action, then the terms with phi replaced by phi r and lambda replaced by lambda, r, we think of the original action. And the rest of the terms, we are counter terms. Okay, so this is one of them. Similarly, sorry, this is phi 1 r. Then minus half. Again, the tilde phi minus one <coughs> phi one r two minus one the tilde phi minus one. Okay, right? These are all the counter terms that we get, and now we have to check if we can cancel the divergences by adjusting the corresponding z's. And we'll in listing the di divergences, we'll of course try to respect this symmetry. Because all graphs manifest over that symmetry. <coughs> so let's take Terms will cancel this divergence. Okay, this means that there are many things in the loop. Okay, one loop, two loop, it doesn't matter. So some graph. I'm just only drawing the x one and the x. I one or phi one are. Which constants here will cancel the divergence? Yes. This one, right? Because this one will cancel the p independent term, and this will cancel the term that is proportional to p square. So this will fix fix the tilde phi and the m. Okay. 
What about this one? So adjusting one set of concepts, you are removing two sets of divergences. Is that automatic? Do you have to, is, do you have to check that this is true? Then, yes? Yeah, because there is a symmetry, phi 1 goes to phi 2, right? So the Feynman rules are manifestly symmetric under this exchange, right? So it's clear from the Feynman rules that whatever divergence you get here will be the same as the divergence that gets. So you don't have to worry about the fact that you have less number of concepts. Okay, that's consistent with what we know from Feynman rules. Okay, now, what about phi 1, phi 2? Is there a divergence of that kind? Phi 1 going in, phi 2 coming out. This graph. Phi 1 r, phi 2 r. Well, if it is there, see, you shouldn't look here first. If, you, if it is there, you can, there's nothing to cancel it. That's clear, right? The question is, will, there, will you get graphs like this? Yeah, there's a phi 1 goes to minus phi 1 symmetry, right? So, in any given vortex, always even number of phi 1s enter. And even number of phi 2s enter, right? So, from the Feynman rules, it follows that you can never get graphs like this. 1 phi 1 going in, 1 phi 2 coming out. Okay, so this is zero, so you don't have to worry. Okay, which is good because it's, if it is not zero, then it will be, there will be a problem, right? Because so you don't have a counter term. What are the possible graphs of this kind, which you have to do? The external legs. All phi 1. That's the possible graph. Phi 1 are phi 1 are phi 1 are phi 1 are. Then? 2 phi 2 is 2 phi 2 is 2 phi 1. First, let's consider all, all phi 2. And then this one. Is there anything else that you have to consider? 3 phi 1, 1 phi 2 or something else like that? What about 3 phi 1, 1 phi 2? No? Yeah, this, this symmetry will overcome that, right? What cancels the divergence of this? What can you adjust to cancel the divergence of this? Z lambda. Because these things have already fixed, right? Z tilde phi and Z f have already been fixed. So this is cancelled by Z lambda. What about this one? Z. And this one? What cancels this? Yeah. There is a phi one square, phi two square counter term. This is Z lambda. Right? So now what do we do? I mean, are these automatically guaranteed that the same Z lambda will cancel all of them? 
Okay, what about these two? If you fix eight lambda from here, is it guaranteed that this will also get cancelled? That is okay, right? Because phi one phi two exchange will make sure that the same z lambda cancels these two. This is a problematic one, right? Okay, this z, this one seems to be use the same z lambda, but doesn't look similar to the others. Is that clear? Okay. But if we rely on symmetry, it better be that this one cancels. The same z lambda that we're turning from here will cancel this. Okay. So we'll not try to verify okay, using the symmetry, but we'll see how we can see that this z lambda will, same z lambda will cancel all of these. So let's first try to see what relation we need among these. So we will compare this with this, okay? Because this is any anywhere identical to this. So to cancel this, we need a counter term of this kind. Phi one r, phi one r. <coughs> Okay. Let's calculate the contribution from this one. Overall data function, let's forget. Okay, that we don't worry about. The momentum function is data function. So what is the contribution to this counter term, to this vortex? Yeah. So we have a minus sign, right? Then I, because that's a vortex factor, z lambda, z tilde of i square minus 1, lambda, anything else we need? The commutative factor, right? What is the commutative factor here? Okay, I actually made one mistake, I think. This, it doesn't matter that much. This would be lambda r over four. Because it was phi star phi whole square, right? And phi star phi was half of phi one square of phi two square. Okay, we can absorb that four inside lambda, but it doesn't matter. Okay, this is lambda r over four, this is good. Correct, this is just in order to be consistent with the original. Okay, so lambda r over 4. Now the combinatorial factor. What is the combinatorial factor here? 4 factorial. 4 times 3 times 2, right? The first one goes in 4 ways, second one goes in 3 ways, third one goes in 2 ways. 4 times 3 times 2. Okay. Now let's look at this one. What is the contribution from this? This factor is the same minus i, z lambda, z tilde of i square minus 1, lambda r over 4 times, there is a 2 here, okay, so 2, and combinatorial factor? 2 times 2, because phi 1 r square, phi 1, first phi 1 can go in 2 ways, second phi 1 has no choice, first phi 2 can go in 2 ways, second 1 has no choice, so 2 times 2. Yeah? So you see this, this part is common between all of them. 
this is 24, this is 8, right? So this is 3 times this, okay? So if the same z lambda has to cancel both divergences in this diagram and this diagram, we have to make sure that the divergent part of this is 3 times the divergent part of this. If the divergent part of this is 3 times the divergent part of this, then the same z lambda will cancel both. Right? Otherwise, no. Is that part clear? Pardon? Yeah, so these two are equal, that of course you know. Just from a 5 1 5 to extend symmetry. Right? So I'm now comparing this with this. So this is going to be cancelled by this counter term, right? And this one is going to be cancelled by this counter term. Right? Since this counter term is 3 times this one, right? if the same z lambda has to cancel both the divergence of this and the divergence of this, it better be the divergent part of this is 3 times the divergent part of this. Those three, three diagrams will cancel each other. So, uh, that should be the three six diagrams. times. Means three, <coughs> three diagrams. So, first two actually cancel the last one. If you think that, there will be six so times this. These, these are. No, no, no. Yeah. The last three diagrams. These three diagrams. Yeah. We are different external legs. Yes. So, these are not the diagrams for the same external leg. Okay. Right? Because you have to cancel the divergence for it. For a given set of external legs, you have to cancel the divergence by itself, right? So you don't combine these three diagrams separately. So the diagram of this has the divergence of this has to be cancelled by the first counter term. That was the first top diagram. And this one has to be cancelled by the second diagram. Is that okay? So let's write down what we need and then we'll see how to change this. So what we need is the divergent part of this is true, then once you make sure that we adjust z lambda so that this cancels the first divergence, then this will automatically cancel the second divergence. So now we will see how we can prove this. So for this, let's recall that the symmetry was phi 1, phi 2 goes to cos alpha sin alpha minus sin alpha cos alpha phi 1, phi 2. And this means for infinitesimal alpha, That's what I will use. Infinitesimal alpha. This goes to phi 1 plus alpha phi 2. Phi 2 minus alpha phi 1. Because for alpha infinitesimal, infinitesimal cos alpha is 1. Right? Because that's for, its expansion starts around alpha squared, which we don't 
sorry, psi alpha is alpha. So phi one plus alpha phi two, phi two minus alpha phi one. So this means that the symmetric transformation is delta phi one is equal to alpha phi two. Delta phi two is equal to alpha phi one minus alpha. Now let's start with a correlation function. Phi one, phi one. Let's put this down. Momentum space correlation. I can put the p one, p two, p three, etc. I'll do it once, but I will not do. What is the value of this? Three phi one one phi two this is zero, right? Because phi one goes to minus phi one symmetry is violated, so this is zero. So if it's zero, its variation should also be zero, right? Make a take a variation of this, the symmetry variation. Okay, that is that. So delta of this is also zero. I can put delta here. Now let's try to calculate delta this explicitly by using the relation that we have here. Right? This, of course, is valid also for the Fourier transform. Right? Alpha is just a constant. So this tells us that phi two tilde, phi one tilde, phi one tilde, phi two tilde. Plus phi two phi one tilde <coughs> phi two tilde phi one tilde phi two tilde plus phi one tilde phi one tilde Now, each of these have three phi one tilde and one phi two tilde, but they are not all equal, okay? Because the momentum arguments are different. Okay, this is p one, p two, p three, p four, right? P one, p two, p three, p four. So they are not e equal. Sorry, two phi ones and two phi two, okay? but they are not all equal, right? Because the momentum arguments are different, but this four phi vortex is logarithmically divergent. That's clear. By power counting, we can check that four phi vortex is logarithmically divergent. We have already seen one example, one loop example. We have already seen, right? This is logarithmically divergent. One over k square, one over k square, d four k. Okay, it's logarithmically divergent. So once you start expanding in Taylor series, only the leading term is divergent. All the subleading contribution, only the parts of e. The, the leading uh, term in the Taylor series expansion is divergent. The expansion coefficients, all for all su subsequent order, are all finite because you differentiate once in respect to p, that will bring down enough momentum factors. So while these three are different, the divergent parts are all equal because how do they differ? They differ in the external momentum, right? Here, this one carries external momentum p1. This carries p2. This carries p3. This carries p4. Here, instead of phi two carrying p1, phi one tilde is carrying p1, p1, phi two tilde is carrying p2. Okay. So the momentums are different, but the divergent part, okay, where you start doing Taylor series expansion around say p equal to zero, divergent part of 
these three are identical. Okay. So that gives you three times divergence, divergent part of phi 1 tilde, phi 1 tilde, phi 2 tilde, phi 2 tilde, <coughs> minus divergent part phi 1 tilde, phi 1 tilde. Right, and that's exactly the relation that we made. Do you know that the divergent part is Exactly, because you know the divergent part coefficient is constant independent of the external momenta. Right? We can just take this as three times the divergent. So you see that indeed, as a consequence of symmetry, this relation holds. Okay, so by adjusting a single z lambda, you can renormalize the theory. But this required using the symmetry in a somewhat non-trivial way. To prove that this relation holds, we have to use the symmetry in a somewhat non-trivial way. If you are working down on the complex variables, this should have been more manifest. Okay, because there you saw that using the arrows. Okay. We have basically added all the counter terms for which that was possible divergences. Once you go to the real variables, the symmetry becomes less manifest. Nevertheless, it's there. Okay, and it guarantees that the theory still continues to be renormalizable. Okay, by renaming the variables, you cannot make a renormalizable theory into non-renormalizable theory. Right? So they will write in terms of phi five star or phi one, phi two. Okay, if the first one was renormalizable, it will continue to be renormalizable. Either the, to prove renormalizability is a little harder, okay, because of this, yeah. because of this relation, right? this doesn't follow manifestly from any symmetry, but of course it follows implicitly from any symmetry. Okay. Yeah. Oh, because I took uh, this is zero, right? Now I'm getting this with respect to the symmetry transform. Yes, so this is 3 phi 1, 1 phi 2, right? But you see, delta phi 1 is alpha phi 2, right? So it converts 1 phi 1 to alpha phi 2 at, a, at one in turn, right? So that's the first three terms. And then the last, when it acts on phi 2, it converts to phi 1. Okay, that's that term. That's by power counting, right? That we know that this, by just by power counting, this is already dimension four, right? So if you go through the analysis, you'll find that this is at most logarithmic divergence. No, but what if it wasn't like that? I mean, you would Well, if it wasn't like that, then you have to expand up to certain powers of momentum yeah. and find appropriate relations, right? So the point is that if the symmetry, if symmetry implies certain things, it will also imply the appropriate relations. Okay, but you have to do some work to prove that that is the case. But it will work in that case. In this, in this case, of course, the yeah. So what I'm saying is that if, if we needed certain relations, no, it will not be an addition to the symmetry. See, the point is, if you couldn't renormalize, right? Then from the beginning, you would have known that you should be able to add some other counter term. Which is consistent with that symmetry, and that counter term will remove the appropriate divergence, right? Yeah. The fact that we have added everything that is possible from that symmetry yeah. means that you shouldn't need any more counter term. Right? But in, to see it in terms of Feynman diagrams requires some effort. Right? In this case, to see it in terms of Feynman diagrams requires you to prove this. Okay? It is a consequence of symmetry. If you don't use symmetry at all, if you just do a brute force calculation of this and this you will find that the divergent part is the divergent part of this is three times the divergent part of this. Right? Here I just showed how it follows as a consequence of symmetry. Right? But you don't have to do any uh, symmetry argument at all. You can just take this Lagrangian that I wrote down right? in terms of phi 1 and phi 2. Just do the calculation. Right? For example, you calculate phi 1, phi 1, phi 1, phi 1 or this one. 
phi 1, phi 1, <coughs> phi 2, phi 2. Of course, you have to do all possible exchanges, right? I mean, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, you have to add all possible diagrams. CR, for example, this could happen phi 1, phi 2, phi 1, phi 2. Right? So if you add all the diagrams here, and all the diagrams here, you should be able to prove explicitly, okay, without going to any of the symmetry argument, that the divergent part of this diagram is three times the divergent part of that diagram. <coughs> is this clear? We can do that for two point one. Pardon? We can do that for two point one five one five. Yeah, but the point is for two point false and it's trivial because you cannot draw draw any diagram. There is no two the diagram for it there is a Yes, that's true. But the point is that that, that is somewhat manifest because of the phi 1 goes to phi 2 symmetry. Right? So this is the relation which was not manifest. It's not crucial. But I'm saying symmetry, if you have added every counter term, for every term corresponding to a given symmetry, you can show that the counter terms that you get are sufficient to the normal theory. Right? In this particular case, it is true that because it's only logarithmic and divergent, that the divergent piece only contains the leading term. But if, the, if it has not logarithmic and divergent, suppose it has quadratic divergent, right? You would expand to one higher order. And the one entities will also give you appropriate relation, which tells you that the one up to one higher order also that corresponding relation for this. Exactly. There are moment of functions and it will uh, the one entities automatically imply that they are called. So once you have used symmetry, I mean uh, 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 the symmetry to fix the number of terms in the action, the theory will be normalized. Right? It's just that in terms of Feynman diagrams, sometimes it might not be easy to see. Yeah, as I said, that uh, here I use symmetry to prove that this relation must hold. Right? But we don't, we don't have to use symmetry at all. You can just directly calculate this Feynman diagrams. You have all the Feynman rules, right? This, that's some of all the Feynman diagrams that correspond to four phi one coupling and two phi one, two phi two coupling. And you will find that after you have taken it on commentary factors, etc., that you get this relation. The divergent part of the first is three times the divergent part of the second one. Is this yeah? Okay, so next time we will then start with the gauge theories. As I have already told you once, that the problem with gauge theory is that gauge symmetry is not there when you do part of theory. Okay. So even if you have added all possible terms in the Lagrangian, consistent with gauge symmetry, okay, which have up to dimension 4. Because the Feynman rules break gauge symmetry, it's not clear that the theory is normalized. Because you have added gauge fixing term, you have added Ghost, right? So now the Feynman rules are no longer gauge invariant. So now you are doing your perturbative calculations. How do we know that the counter terms that are implied by original gauge invariant action are sufficient to remove all the divergences? Because now the Feynman rules are no longer gauge invariant, right? Here the reason that this relation hold, holds is because the Feynman rules are invariant under this symmetry. Right? Nothing in the Lagrangian has broken this symmetry. Right? The Lagrangian with which you are driving your Feynman rules is respect this symmetry. But in gauge theory, the Lagrangian with, respect, with which you are driving your Feynman rules do not have gauge symmetry. Right? Because the host action doesn't have a gauge symmetry. The um, uh, gauge fixing term doesn't have gauge symmetry. So they are showing, proving gauge invariance, proving the fact that there are enough counter terms to renormalize the theory because more tricky. And we'll see how to handle that next time.